David Hahn, also known as the Radioactive Boy Scout, built a nuclear reactor in his mom's backyard using common household items when he was 17. As shocking as it is that a teenager built a nuclear reactor at his mom's house, the story of what made it all possible and the disastrous mess it created is even more unbelievable. David was born just outside of Detroit, Michigan in 1976. His parents, who both worked for General Motors when the company employed nearly everyone in the area, divorced when David was very young. Growing up, he spent most of his time at his dad and stepmom's house and weekends at his biological mom, Patty's house. When he was 10, his grandfather, his stepmom's dad, gave him a seemingly harmless gift that would set this chain of events in motion. The gift was a book called The Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments, and David became instantly obsessed. He set up a small laboratory in his bedroom at his father's house, but this wasn't like the pretend fun with beakers full of water and food coloring. No, David bought legitimate beakers, Bunsen burners, test tubes, and lined his shelves with chemistry books and encyclopedias. By age 14, when most kids are messing around with harmless experiments or making baking soda volcanoes, David had made nitroglycerin. David was also in the Boy Scouts and one time showed up to a camping trip with a bright orange face caused by an overdose of camphor, which he claimed he was using to test methods for artificial tanning. He was literally experimenting on himself as a kid. On that same trip, David, along with some fellow scouts, blew a hole in one of their tents by igniting a stockpile of magnesium David had brought to make fireworks. Despite his father and stepmom's frequent concerns about small explosions and chemical spills in his bedroom, they didn't stop his experiments, they just moved his lab to the basement to stop him from destroying his room, leaving pockmarks on the walls and spilling chemicals on the carpet. This is probably where it should have been stopped, but it wasn't, and David started heading down a more dangerous path. Banning him to the basement was actually the opposite of punishing him. Now, he had more room and privacy to conduct his experiments. He became even more obsessed and focused on chemistry, holding various after-school jobs to make money to buy materials for his experiments. Soon, David would do something that would require another move for his lab. He got hold of a bunch of red phosphorus, essentially match heads, and placed it in a glass container, hammering it with a screwdriver. It exploded, injuring his hands and arms badly. He had to have glass shards removed from his eyes because, of course, David wasn't wearing goggles. This seems like the time any parent or guardian would stop the chemistry kit. But in this case, David just moved his lab to his biological mother's potting shed in her backyard. And that's where things started to get radioactive. David spent countless hours in the shed doing God knows what, while his mother and her boyfriend never checked in on him. They were in awe of his work ethic and dedication. One day, his mom's boyfriend, Michael, asked him what he was up to, and David responded, you know, someday we're going to run out of oil. David's dad thought his son should use his obsessive work ethic for something useful, like becoming an Eagle Scout. Eagle Scouts need to earn 21 merit badges across various disciplines. Some are mandatory, but a few are Scouts' choice. You could earn a badge in business or woodworking, for example, but David opted to earn a badge in atomic energy, which raised no concerns, even though he was the only scout in his troop to go for that merit badge and had a history of blowing himself up. David put together a pamphlet with the help of several utility companies to earn his atomic energy badge. The pamphlet argued that nuclear energy was good, vital, and needed more study. He also made a chart explaining nuclear fission and a harmless toy model nuclear reactor using a juice can, coat hangers, soda straws, kitchen matches, and a rubber band. David visited a hospital's radiology unit to learn how radioactive isotopes were used and, in the end, was awarded his Atomic Energy Merit Badge on May 10, 1991, just months before his 15th birthday. Not content with his toy nuclear reactor made of soda cans and coat hangers, David decided to build an actual radioactive nuclear power reactor in his mom's potting shed, and he did. But to do so, David had to overcome several obstacles, and a few more adults had to not ask any questions. David set out to build a breeder reactor, a type of nuclear reactor that generates power and continuously creates new fuel for itself in a self-sustaining cycle, theoretically solving the world's energy problems. A few large-scale breeder reactors were built, but they were either shut down for not producing cost-effective energy or suffered partial meltdowns. To simplify the science behind it, 
reactors use a radioactive element like uranium or plutonium as fuel for a sustained chain reaction called fission. Fission occurs when a neutron combines with the nucleus of a radioisotope, turning it into an unstable form that splits in half, releasing massive energy and causing a chain reaction. Anyway, the point is, David needed highly radioactive and extremely dangerous materials to build his reactor. That should have been impossible, right? Nope. Here's how he did it, and it will shake your faith in everything. David pretended to be a college professor, writing letters and making calls to places like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NRC, the American Nuclear Society, the Edison Electric Institute, and the Atomic Industrial Forum. No one double-checked his fabricated identity. A representative from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ended up walking David through the entire process of obtaining and isolating radioactive isotopes. Normally, no one could legally obtain large enough amounts of radioactive material to pose a real danger. But this was David. He was an Eagle Scout. David later said, The NRC gave me all the information I needed. All I had to do was get the materials. And he did. From his conversations with government officials and by reading old Boy Scout booklets, David learned that small amounts of radioactive elements could be found in smoke detectors, old luminous clocks, and camping lanterns. One of each wouldn't cut it. David needed a lot more than any normal person would ever buy, so he kept pretending to be a professor and began procuring radioactive elements from everyday items. First, he called a smoke detector company, saying he needed 100 detectors for a school project. They agreed to ship him 100 detectors for a low price and told him exactly where the radioactive material was located in the device without ever confirming his identity. David received the detectors, removed the radioactive material, a americium-241, welded it all together and placed it inside a lead casing with a small hole, creating what's known as a neutron gun, the first step toward fission. No adults stepped in. Keeping with his obsessive work ethic and with no one questioning him, David extracted thorium from thousands of old camping lanterns and obtained radium from luminescent clocks he bought at an antique store. He also ordered uranium from Czechoslovakia and barium sulfate from the local hospital's radiology department. David made a makeshift reactor core from the radium and americium from the smoke detectors and clocks. He surrounded the radioactive ball with a blanket of tiny foil-wrapped thorium ash cubes from the lanterns and uranium powder stacked with carbon cubes and held together by duct tape. Now he had a fully functional and dangerously radioactive nuclear reactor in his mom's backyard, and no one knew. Since David was a teenager and had no business doing any of this, and wasn't known for safety precautions, the radioactivity from his reactor kept rising. It was already extremely hazardous, and David soon realized he might be putting others in danger. He was able to detect the radiation from his reactor five doors down, so he decided to dismantle it and distribute the radioactive material. At 2.40 a.m. on August 31, 1994, the police were called by David's neighbors who thought he was stealing tires from cars. He wasn't. He was loading his nuclear reactor into his own car. When the cops didn't trust him, David warned them that it was radioactive. They assumed he had an atomic bomb, so the bomb squad was called in. Thankfully, they realized he didn't have an atomic bomb, but measured 1,000 times the normal background radiation. This triggered the Federal Radiological Emergency Response Plan. It took two months for any real action to be taken. When David was first arrested, he didn't mention his lab in the shed. When they finally looked, two months after his arrest, the NRC did nothing because the shed wasn't a federally recognized nuclear site. It wasn't until January, five months after David's arrest, that the EPA visited his lab. They found that the lab posed a significant danger to public health and the environment, with potential exposure to nearby humans, animals, and the food chain. They didn't know it at the time, but David's mom had thrown away a lot of the radioactive material into regular trash, spreading radiation even further. In June, the EPA dismantled the potting shed, sealed it up, and buried it in a landfill in the Great Salt Lake Desert, where it remains alongside other radioactive waste. According to the EPA, David's experiments exposed at least 40,000 people to cancer-causing radiation. If there's a lesson to be learned from this, it's not that kids shouldn't build nuclear reactors in their backyard. It's that everyone is just kind of winging it when it comes to situations like David's. None of the adults or agencies you trust to keep you safe knew what to do, and everything was chaos. We see this repeatedly in places like Flint, where the water is poisonous, or outside of St. Louis, 
where radioactive waste from the Manhattan Project is left in a landfill, causing illness and death, with little done about it. In 1995, the EPA arranged for David to undergo a full examination to see what kind of damage the radiation had done, but David refused, fearful of what he might learn. David Hahn died in 2016 at 39 from alcohol poisoning, a tragic end. But the real tragedy is that it seems all this could have been avoided if some adults had just paid attention. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more of history's weirdness you won't find in textbooks.